So today we're going to be presenting two recent SNARKs which have come out and the reason we're doing a joint pre presentation is because they are very, very similar. Um, these are something which we're hoping that people are going to use. So we're really going to be focusing this talk not only on sort of what they are, how they work, but also on sort of certain practicalities behind them, like, for example, how you would actually generate this universal setup, which I will explain later. So I don't want to dwell too much on what a snack is, because I think most people here already know. Um, it's related to zero-knowledge proofs, and you can use a snark in order to prove that a computation has been carried out correctly. You can also keep some of the inputs to this computation private if you need to, which is very nice. And you have that uh, verifying these computations is much cheaper than it would be to run the computation yourself. In order to actually be able to run Snack, so we have a we always have a setup. You have to be able to generate a set of public parameters shared by all parties. But as for what this setup look, looks like, we kind of have some different styles. So the one that we'd really like is a transparent setup. And the idea here is that the setup just takes public inputs and outputs public outputs and Given this, nobody is able to know the information they would need to break the security of the scheme. Uh, the thing that we have for our most efficient schemes, which is sometimes problematic, is a trusted setup. And these are quite hard to coordinate because you have to do an individual trusted setup for every single application that you're going to run them for. And sort of between this space is a trade-off which we're calling a universal setup. So the idea here is that there is still an element of trust involved. However, we only require one setup across all of the different applications, and that makes life a lot easier. So some examples of transparent setups. We have Bulletproofs, we have Starks, we have Spartan, and we have Halo. And these are all good protocols, but they have, in the case of Stark Spartan, uh, they have like slightly larger proof sizes. In the case of Bulletproofs, they have larger verifier time. And in the case of Halo, you really need to be in a setting where you can batch your proofs, which I'll again go into more detail later. And sometimes these costs are outside the realms of feasibility. And when they become feas infeasible, you start to say, okay, what else can I do? If you want something really fast, we do not know how to beat the schemes with trusted setup. They have the smallest proof size, they have the smallest prover computation, they have the verifier time we're now sort of kind of getting on par with, but those other two things we really haven't been able to beat. And kind of the way you do this is that there is a specialization phase where you take your public parameters and you upload a description of your program into your public parameters. And that particular phase is done as part of the trusted setup, which is why we have to do a different setup for each application. So in a universal phase, that specialization process, it's still done um, at some point in time, but we can make it so that it's not done during the trusted setup. And this is why we're able to run them across lots of different applications. So in the case of Sonic, the specialization is done after proofs have already been generated. So you have your trusted setup, and then you have many, many provers that take in the output of that and they generate proofs. And they then pass on their proofs to some untrusted party who aggregates them together. And only then does the verifier check the proof. So then the verifier will compute for themselves a specialization um, description of the circuit. But they only have to do this once. 
and the rest of the process they can do for the rest of their uh, computation time goes towards actually checking the proofs. But what this means is it means that if you're just checking one sonic proof at a time, this is really not efficient. You only get efficiency if you're checking, say, 100 at a time or something on that scale. So this was kind of the problem that Marlin and Plonk were trying to tackle. They were saying, what if you're not in a position where you can batch your proofs? Over to Zach. Cool. Hello. Is this off? Is this off? Go on. Uh, I turn this on? Yeah, it's on. Oh, it's on. <laughs> Sorry. Just, uh, do you want to, should we swap? Oh, yeah, or? Uh, okay, cool. Hello. Um, so, yes. Um, uh, what if you're in a setting where batching proofs is difficult? So, for example, um, if you are, for example, creating a smart contract where you want some private variables, um, batching proofs will be difficult because uh, Storing individual transactions on chain as you aggregate them into a batch, that's going to be extremely expensive. Uh, if you aggregate your proofs off chain, then you start getting into big coordination problems and kind of race conditions um, and uh, censorship attacks. And uh, if your smart contract is relatively low throughput, then you start getting latency problems because it's going to take a very long time to, to collect enough uh, tr proofs together to actually verify them as a batch. So it's not ideal for kind of one off applications. Um, and it's not ideal for kind of small niche boutique snarks um, that, <laughs> um, that can't benefit from amortizing uh, the cost of ver verifying a batch. Um, so the question then is what, what to do about it. Um, and this is where the, where, oh dear, I can't do tech, sorry, one second. Yes, this is where the new wave uh, of snarks comes in. So Marlon and Plonk. Um, as a brief aside, I believe Marlon was named as such because Marlon is a very fast fish. fish. Yes, yes it was. And plonk is slang for cheap wine, <laughs> um, uh, where the commonality is uh, working on plonk uh, gave me a headache, <laughs> uh, similarly to consuming it. Um, so, uh, but both of these share, share a lot of similarities. Um, the circuit construction has two phases to it. So you have your kind of your trusted setup where you're generating this structured reference string. Um, which you have to do as a, as a one-off cost. And then um, the second stage is this kind of untrusted circuit specialization process where you um, use your trusted setup to, um, the output of your trusted setup to encode um, a specific circuit. And this is done in an entirely trustless manner. Um, anybody can verify that this, has been this processing step has been performed correctly and it doesn't require generating any new secrets. Um, the structured reference string that comes out of these things is typically quite a bit smaller than the non-succinct snarks as well, which is um, particularly useful when you have large circuits uh, with millions of constraints, um, and where storing the reference string will become a problem. Um, so, a little bit of a flow of how this how this works in the in the succinct universal world is you have your little structure set up, then you go through this specialization phase, which, like, to verify any proof of knowledge. Um, of a program, the verifier is going to have to perform some kind of linear time computation. Um, so what we do here is we kind of we cheat a little bit, where we perform, uh, we kind of create succinct commitments to the information that a verifier needs to verify a circuit. Um, this will be at least linear time, but you only have to do it once, uh, and then you can serve multiple proofs of knowledge repeatedly over and over again, and the verifier can verify those all in kind of a near constant time, um, which is great. It's what we're aiming for. So uh, I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, Plonk, uh, and then Ray's going to talk a little bit about Marlin. Um, so with Plonk, you have a circuit which is described with addition and multiplication gates, so like the relatively standard construction. Um, however, unlike something like Roth16, uh, addition gates aren't free because we have limited structure we can embed into our reference string. Um, but you can actually get you can get custom logic gates instead. So you, if you, you so that you can have things that are a little bit more niche than an additional multiplication gate. So, for example, you can uh, have a gate that checks that uh, constraint is a boolean. Uh, you can have a gate which evaluates one round of a mimic hash function. Um, so you can have this kind of extra custom customization that doesn't going to incur any extra prover time or verif not much verifier time. Um, but I can get, can get on to that later on in questions if people are curious. Um, uh, but uh, as Mary said, this talk is really to get people to uh, use this stuff. This isn't, uh, this isn't just theory. Um, we're pulling this into the world um, and planning on using it for Aztec, but our, our tooling and libraries are all open source. This is some um, uh, of the benchmarks of our proof construction and verification library that we have, um, where 
Um, this might be a little bit hard to see in the distance, but uh, this is benchmarks for kind of um, randomized trunk circuits with a um, uh, uh, varying number of arithmetic gates. So this includes addition and multiplication gates. So um, the amount of work you can do per gate will be less than a, than a uh, growth style construction. Uh, but you can see here, even for a million gates, um, running on a relatively weedy um, laptop, my Surface Pro, uh, you can construct a proof of knowledge in under 23 seconds. Um, so that's quite um, rel pretty snappy, and we, we're very confident this is kind of um, fast enough for um, general purpose use case, where if you have, uh, if you want privacy preserving transactions and you encode the logic of that as a snark, then people will be able to construct proofs of knowledge of that snark using consumer grade hardware, standard laptops, um, and that's something we're very, very excited by. Um, and also this uses the BN254 curve, um, uh, so, um, which uh, is the, the only curve of theory of sports that's a pre compiled its security is not as high as curves like BLS381, um, but it's, it's, still, it's still very sufficient for the kind of um, proof construction that we're doing. Um, and verify time under, a millis under two milliseconds. Uh, so in terms of gas costs on Ethereum, uh, post EIP 1108, it's going to run you at about 250,000 gas to verify Planck snark. Uh, and uh, you don't incur extra costs for larger numbers of public inputs, um, like, like you might with Gross 16. Um, right, what's the next slide? Oh yes, uh, and the proof size. Um, so if you're over the um, uh, kind of old Zcash curve, then your proof size will be half a kilobyte. Uh, so these proofs are, are very small and compact. Um, just to kind of summarize the efficiency analysis, things that Plonk is really good at. Um, so this is like uh, asterisk um, if you implement a couple of custom gates that we're rolling into our Berettenberg proof construction library. It's extremely good at binary decomposition. Uh, with one constraint, you can, um, you can kind of concatenate together two binary variables. Um, it's great at sequential hash algorithms like MIMIC um, and also elliptic curve primitives where you can use custom gates to kind of evaluate an elliptic curve point addition. Uh, in a couple of constraints, which means that Pedersen hashes, that kind of stuff, very, very efficient. Uh, it's not great at thing where um, large linear relationships, so if you have very high fan in um, linear relations, uh, big fan in addition gates, or you're trying to do matrix addition or matrix multiplication. So, for example, um, uh, sponge based hash constructions like Poseidon, uh, then Planck is, um, it, you'll, you'll, incur, you'll incur extra costs for the addition gates um, because that, that isn't free. Uh, and that's the link to our. Uh, library, if people want to have a, have a look, have a play around, uh, as it's all open source and um, contributions are very welcome. <laughs> right. Sorry, we switch. Okay, so I'm um, now just going to talk through some of the numbers in Marlin. I should say that with um, the proof size and the prover time, we have some ideas that we're currently working on in order to get these down further. So these are just, I would say, uh, upper bound on the proof size at the moment. But you can see we're talking roughly a kilobyte if you're talking BN um, 256. You were 254, weren't you? Is it the One, same? Two, I'm not sure there's a consensus on it, but it's, it's <laughs> the old Zcash curve. <laughs> yeah. um, and we're talking 1.3 kilobytes for the BLS 381 currently. In terms of the prover time, it is a bit slower than GROT16. As I said before, we're still not in a position where we can match GROT16, but not overly so. It's okay. Okay, so likewise with the verifier time, we do get a bit higher costs because we have uh, additional field operations, which you wouldn't be having to do with GROT16. Right. That's everything. Um, okay, switch through. Sorry. Um, uh, so yeah, so um, we're very excited to kind of talk about like the applications for Snarks because that's really what we're getting at here. Like the technology is it's, it's nice and, and and cool, but really what you can use it for is what is really my what, what drives me and what drives us at Aztec. Um, and so just here are some examples of the things that we are either currently working with um, partners to integrate um, or kind of plans that we have uh, that we. Have for Plonk once the, once the technology is more mature. Um, obviously, private digital currencies and private stable coins, uh, things like uh, the Zcash cryptocurrency or the carbon stable coin, um, something we're very excited by, as well as bringing traditional financial instruments on chain, um, uh, where you can kind of, where you can provide the 
privacy guarantees that you would expect with, with kind of old school financial services, but you can use the consensus of a public blockchain to massively improve efficiency and access. Um, and then things like voting, obviously anonymous voting, and uh, dark contracts is the thing that really excites us. Basically, um, a smart contract where not only is the, are the inputs and outputs of your smart transaction private, uh, not only are the identities of the transaction senders private, but the actual code that you're executing is also private. Um, which means it can be proprietary, um, but you can still use the consensus um, of a public blockchain to, to execute it. Um, so, but here's a question to the floor, really. Like, kind of, what, what, are, what are the applications that you're interested in seeing? What are the stuff, what's the stuff that you would like to build if the technology was a bit more mature? Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we're gonna kind of have a little bit of a brief enforced Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> so I expect, uh, anyway. Um, so, really, questions for the for the audience: like, what and what what are the, what kind of applications would you like to build? Imagine you had kind of inf like, tooling was perfect, technology was mature, you know, there were no problems. It was just like booting, writing some JavaScript, um, although hopefully more secure. Um, what applications would you would you like to see? What what drives you? So really great, isn't it? <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. Um, yeah, that's pretty much where all of this is making a beeline towards, I think. Um, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not a technology you want to retrofit onto a existing problem. Uh, if you're just searching for a solution, so some examples. Actually, what kind of got Aztec um, and, and our team into blockchain in the first place was we weren't originally a privacy company. Um, we were doing syndicated loans um, and corporate debt uh, on the um, on chain, so um, making processes much more efficient. Um, kind of um, allowing um, different like lending institutions to coordinate with one another um, to create these financial instruments, these loans, um, even though they didn't trust one another, they were competitors. They just had, but they had to coordinate to achieve a common goal. So, uh, for example, they weren't comfortable sharing data with one another because they feared, feared it would be monetized. Uh, things that are public blockchain are perfect for um, for trustless execution, but obviously. Privacy was a massive, massive problem because it is a huge competitive disadvantage if everybody knows what you're holding and what you're trading. Um, and so that's really what got us into privacy, what got us into Aztec. And so doing that kind of, um, kind of uh, massively improving kind of the efficiency and access to existing markets um, by putting these assets on chain. I question over there. Did we answer it yet? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you would like to have not only the ability to sort of run um, computations over encrypted data on chain, but you would also like to be able to query that encrypted data yeah, in order to get yeah. relevant information out. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's quite doable. You could use a SNOR signature for that, even. Sorry? That's quite doable. You could use SNOR for that, for example. So it's, it's going to... Do you need to trust the setup? So it depends. If you, if, you want to, if you want to kind of transmit private information on chain, then you can do that with um, digital signatures, SNOR signatures. You can encrypt information. If you want to kind of perform, um, evaluate m like logic using the encrypted data, if you want to perform, like evaluate math some mathematical expression, then that becomes a lot harder, um, and that's what you need snarks for. Um, Can pardon? Twenty-three seconds. 
Oh, private payments. Yeah, that's 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 kind of ground zero for us. And um, hopefully, well, we're going to have some more on this later. But we're launching our ASIC 1.0 mainnet protocol. Uh, hopefully, uh, next month once our MPC is complete, and that is exactly what we will be enabling. So snarks aren't really something you use for encryption. Snarks would be something you would use to prove that you have done the computation on the encrypted data correctly. Mm -hmm. So it would stop people from being able to return false replies to your so queries. You can't, you can't really use it for analytics. It wouldn't, you could probably do machine learning models and you can actually prove characteristic machine learning models, for example, the kind of lab terms, right? So for deep learning pipelines, you can actually have some yeah, so if you, want to, if you want to prove you've performed a computation correctly, you want to hide some of the information, that's great for a snark. If you want to perform a computation on encrypted data that you yourself can't decrypt, that's where you need fully homomorphic encryption for. That's all right. So you can't, then your application analytics won't be possible It would be possible. It might be expensive with the current state of the art, and it would depend on what the computation was. But if what you wanted to do was run a um, computation on encrypted data, so using homomorphic encryption, and prove that you have done that computation correctly, that's where you would use a snark. Mm. So, you, it, so it's homomorphic yes, you'd yeah, have to, it, you would have to combine the two, yeah, two it's techniques. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> Could you give examples of dark so, okay, so a dark contract, for example, um, okay, so if we're going to go completely pie in the sky, something which um, would excites me is imagine uh, you want to create a decentralized organization to fund investigative journalism in a repressive country where that wouldn't be tolerated or allowed. So, this might be a bit hard um, and <laughs> not a panacea, but with a dark contract, what you could do is you could create a DAO type structure. Um, with explicit rules about governance, about funding, except that that smart contract would be hidden from the world. So the stakeholders in that contract would be hidden. Um, the amount of capital that that contract has would be hidden. Where it deploys it to would be hidden. Um, and any votes that are held to determine where, that, where its funds should be distributed would also be hidden. Uh, all of the transactions interacting with that dark contract would just look like random gibberish going to the blockchain. You wouldn't even be able to tell which contract was being called. Um, and yeah, so it would open up some potentially quite powerful use cases. But, but like, there's also the existential problem that also introduces. Is that something that, is that something you should build? <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, and <laughs> certainly not, not something that Aztec is building right now. <laughs> <laughs> because that is, that is basically like, like poking a can of nitroglycerin with it with a stick. Um, but something, for example, what we're doing with things like Aztec is you, you can create that, that kind of structure, but you can have kind of viewing keys um, that allow you to decrypt the contracts, that allow you to decrypt the identities of the people interacting with it. Uh, and then you, but those viewing keys aren't av available to the general public. You can give them to auditors, to regulators, and still have confidence that uh, like people peeping on the blockchain and its transaction records wouldn't be able to see anything. Anonymous credentials, okay, so you're thinking about um, ways where you can verify that you have, say, access to a building or that kind of thing. Why are we still using the username and passwords? Should be using blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a kind of a more, a deeper question because obviously if you use, I mean, things like Ethereum private key is very powerful, very expressive, if you lose it, you can't call somebody up <laughs> um, to, re to reset it. Although people like Argent are, are kind of doing an incredible job at tackling that problem. Um, yeah, credential sharing, KYC, incredibly useful. If you can kind of prove that you've been KYC'd by a trusted party without actually revealing who you are or without having to give that, your K like the, the KYC individual, information that they can then sell on and monetize um, is extremely powerful, yeah. Sorry, could you repeat that question? 
Heaviness. Yeah. Mm. How much block space is it going to take? So, when it comes, so um, for transactions on things like Ethereum, there are kind of two limitations: is the computation you're performing and the amount of like physical storage space it's going to take. Um, and so, the storage space theoretically for a proof is absolutely tiny; it's about 512 bytes, and the computation is minimal. It's like 250,000 gas. Also, bearing in mind that this wouldn't be proofs that you would keep around forever. Oh, sorry. Also, bearing in mind this isn't proofs that you would keep around forever. Forever, they are proofs which you would see, verify, discard. Mm. On the other hand, if it, it's very application specific. Um, for example, if you want to encode the, some, the logic of a side chain as a snark, where one snark proof is validating, say, ten thousand transactions, um, then you start to run into a data availability problem because. Um, the amount of information that you will then need to construct a proof of knowledge over that side chain becomes quite large because every single transaction that occurs, you need to, like it'll it'll take roughly if it's private about 32 bytes of information, and if you do not have the log of every single transaction on that side chain, you can't serve proofs of knowledge extracting your value, your money from that side chain, um, which is a problem. Um, and so if you want to put that all on chain. That gives you a relatively hard cap on how, mu how many transactions something like Ethereum can support. To give it, an, actually, I think Harry, much better, better person for this, <laughs> uh, for when it comes to kind of ro roll ups on Ethereum. Um, like, what, how much, like, if you wanted to consume an entire gas, block's worth of gas on something like a roll up. Um, sorry, I've really put you on the spot here. Uh, I feel <laughs> nervous now. Um, I, I don't know, 500 transactions per second is uh, reasonable. If you compress every transaction down into eight bytes, you can discard hundreds of bytes of signatures per transaction. Uh, it's just a case of uh, it'll cost you thousands in compute time to make the proofs for that. It's expensive, but yeah, it's cheap in different ways. Yeah, yeah. so that kind of gives you a, a a pretty hard cap on what something like Ethereum can support with this technology. I think we should move on to the next question. That's a very good one. Point. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that people in this room have come across which they've been there like, I would love to do one of these applications which we've specified here, but there's this technical barrier, with the technical barrier not being sort of proof size verifier time, we already know to work on that, but maybe something that we haven't forth thought of? Analysis. <laughs> and, and you're not happy. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really an issue. And because like you're really clever people, like kind of building different things, like which one like what 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 would I do Marlin or Plum? <laughs> Both would work. <laughs> So you're saying that you would like to see more standardization across which schemes we're recommending people to use? You guys work closely together and like, yeah. one thing well, less well, as many. It's a, it's a fair complaint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've heard something else which uh, sounded really interesting, but I heard about that like one, two years ago, and then I've never heard about it. So I don't know if maybe this sort of technologies can be used for that. Was uh, having an algorithm that runs only one time, only one time, then it expires, so you can't run it again. So cryptographic queries like those ones, maybe I have no idea how, but it would be really interesting to see if these sort of So you'd like to see a greater range of applications and a smaller range of schemes? No. Is that, okay, I've under, misunderstood. Just an algorithm. Let's say I've got an algorithm. You have an algorithm. Have algorithm right? It does but, something. Yeah, and I want to sell it. But I want it to run just one. Oh, I see. That's more like a fatigue kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> fatigue is not a complication. Okay. Mm. So you want to make it so that people can only run an algorithm once. Yeah. yeah. That's quite cool. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> yeah. If you want to run it once, essentially what it is. But obfuscation is different because obfuscation is really hard to read. No, 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 no. You can just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can make it like a kind of like a self destructing algorithm. Um, like <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just like spitballing some random ideas here, but like obfuscation is a very hard problem yeah. if it boils down to that. But I think if you could specify which inputs it could be run on mm. in advance, that might that might help. Yeah. yeah. Um, you could also do things like um, 
you could say you could be the only person that runs the algorithm, people have to give you your data, but then you can serve a proof of knowledge that you run it correctly, and then you can... That's easier. That's yeah. Easier. Yeah. Um, what else are you working on? What else are we working on? So, at the moment, like what, what I'm... At, we're, our Aztec is working on, we're kind of, um, Plonk is more of a longer, t well, middle, medium, medium term R&D project for us. Um, we are very close to launching our kind of um, mainnet um, private digital, uh, private asset protocol, um, which will allow people to create uh, confidential tokens. Um, so tokens where the values are encrypted, um, identities aren't, but you can use a stealth address protocol to provide anonymity if that's something that you want as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of the key focus of what we're doing. Uh, we're planning on, in the short, medium term, using Plonk to then fully hide the transaction graph um, for ASIC transactions and then making them much more expressive. Um, and then longer term, dark contracts. So, yeah. so how does Plonk fit into like, the transition between ASIC 1.0 and 2.0? Because mm. you use Plonk for your MPC, then you use Plonk again for the so our MPC is, is quite serendipitous. Um, it's used for both Aztec 1.0 and Plonk. They, use, they need exactly the same structured reference string. Um, and um, we designed our kind of our smart contract protocol, our cryptography engine, to be upgradable uh, over time. So you, we can add new families of zero-knowledge proofs into them. And so um, we can and will be adding a Plonk family um, with upgrade paths so that if you have um, asset digital, like private assets, um, Aztec notes created with our current protocol, you'll be able to migrate them. Um, and uh, convert them into Plonk style notes. And the upgrade runs on a multi sig? Pardon? The upgrade, um, the software you use on multi sig? Oh, for our cryptography engine. Yeah, yeah, to upgrade it. Um, who has the keys? Who does have the keys? Not me. Um, <laughs> no, they, I, don't, you, no, don't trust me with secrets. Um, uh, I don't actually know who has the multi sig keys. Um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. Um, but um, it's, it's more than just Aztec. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but I, I, I will have to get back to you on that one. So, one of the things that has stopped me in the past from using zero knowledge proofs is that they're just not available from the moment mm. that I'm using at the time. So, you know, I look over there and it's like in Haskell or something, and I'm like, well, how the hell do I integrate Haskell into my Go program? And then, on top of that, there's a question about whether you can trust them. So, you found some random GitHub repo and you're like, is this good code? And there's really no way for you to verify that that code is correct. So potentially having some kind of third party assessment and a mm. clear bit of documentation that can allow maybe less technical people to follow through and understand the validity of this zero knowledge group. Okay, so you have two things. You first. Two things. You first want us to try and implement SNARKs across a variety of languages, so not just well, Rust, I think, is the fashionable one at the moment, but also um, things like Go and um, what else? Oh, what other languages? Python, yeah. <laughs> um, and the second thing you were saying, hold on a sec. Um, I got distracted by both. Code. Oh, more audits of mm. um, the code that is being output. Is that the idea? Mm. Okay, Completely. so most of the stuff we have at the moment is very, very new. So the reason it hasn't been audited yet is, I would say, because it's too new, but people are, are moving towards this. Yeah. Um, absolutely, uh, and definitely anything that Aztec pushes to production is gets audited. Um, our Aztec 1.0 code base has been audited by the consistent due diligence team. We're currently completing a security audit by Trailer Bits, um, and so um, for us, yeah, that's extremely important that pe we can, people who use our code and our software can have confidence that it works. Can you actually see that it's been audited? I'm not sure. But we'll definitely, yeah, we'll get on that. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be okay. good. So just so that people can hear on the video, the comment there was that we should always have a um, signed comment from our auditors on mm. audited code on GitHub so that developers can actually tell that this is audited code. Mm. Yep. Cool. We should move on. Yep. Okay. What's the next slide? Ah. Ah. Switcheroo. 
Okay, we're, we're going to get a little technical now, I'm sorry. Um, so when you're building a snark, they almost always work in the same kind of way. You start by saying, how can I describe my program as a system of constraints? You next say, given my system of constraints, how can I um, change these into a, some kind of polynomial expression? In the case of universal things, you need them to be univariate. And um, then you finally say, given this polynomial equation, how can I verify that that holds? And the way we do this in Marlin and Planck is using a polynomial commitment scheme. And you'll notice that the only thing in all of these three steps that requires any cryptography at all is the polynomial commitment. So my takeaway from this is that when we build better polynomial commitments, we almost always will get faster snarks from those better polynomial commitments. And this is something that people have been working on a lot recently. It's a quite a big research area. What is a polynomial commitment? The idea is that you can commit to a polynomial and when a verifier asks you to evaluate that polynomial at a point of its choosing, you can not only evaluate that polynomial, but prove that you have evaluated it correctly. That's all it is. Currently, both Marlin and Planck and Sonic are using adaptations of the KCG10 scheme which is pairing based and it is the reason why we are having to do a setup in the first place. And there have been recent works which have been looking at getting rid of this setup by building polynomial commitment schemes which don't require setup. So the first is a polynomial commitment scheme by the people at Matterlabs. And their aim here was not only for something transparent but also for something post-quantum. How to actually uh, integrate this with existing schemes would require a bit more work still, because post-quantum stuff is always a bit more, um, you come across issues in the security proofs which you then have to fix, but it's definitely a very sort of, I would say, hopeful direction. Uh, one that's come out very recently, and I would say it's quite topical, is called Duck. And this is building polynomial commitment schemes from groups of unknown order. So we know two of these, really. One is RSA, which again would require a setup in order to get the, um, the RSA parameters, so that, that wouldn't count as untrusted. But the other is class groups. And class groups, I would say, are quite poorly understood and poorly implemented, but once we get sort of a better understanding and better implementations, they have a transparent setup and they're a very sort of hopeful direction as well. And the last one is Halo. And what this is doing is it's taking uh, um, one of the arguments from bulletproofs and it's applying it to polynomial commitment schemes. And they are able to get something which is efficient in the sonic type setting when you can verify many proofs at once, so say 100 proofs at once. That would be a good situation to use Halo. It's less good for Marlin and Planck because in our situation we're trying to get fast verifier time just for one proof and Halo doesn't do that. Right. Hmm, handouts. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, the table over there, um, we have, um, with Mary and I, have created like s some uh, handouts that kind of describe Plonk and Marlin in a bit more technical depth because we wanted to kind of um, not splash uh, 50 different random equations on a, on a, on a slide uh, and expect people to follow. Um, so, uh, they are over there if people want to have a, have, a, have a gander after the talk. Um, basically, it describes um, the Planck handout describes how Planck works, like the, kind of the, the intuition behind what we are trying to do, which is um, if you, uh, we sort of kind of represent a program circuits uh, using vectors of variables instead of polynomials because vectors are more natural than intuitive, and then find a way of translating those vectors uh, into weird, weird fancy polynomials that you can then commit to with a succinct polynomial commitment scheme. Um, and then um, it goes into a bit more detail about this kind of this idea of a local gate check and a global consistency check, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and then how to achieve that 
global consistency check via a permutation argument, which, hang on, might become a bit clearer here. So um, if you have a system of constraints, um, like subscribe with an arithmetic circuit that's made up of additional multiplication gates. So in Planck, actually, we have kind of like one universal gate structure, which you can either morph into an addition or a multiplication gate, depending on your, your needs. Um, checking that, like kind of the, imp like each gate has um, its, like the wires feeding into and out of each gate to satisfy, that's relatively easy to do. Um, what's a lot harder is checking that all the wires connect up correctly. Um, so effectively, um, if you have a gate where one output wire is feeding into two input wires, how do you check those values are the same and that a prover hasn't cheated um, and provided different values? So that's um, really one of the key innovations of Planck, and we use a permutation check for that. Um, and so this is a, a, an example that Mary, Mary came up with, which is a lot better than anything I've ever come, <laughs> managed to think about. Basically, imagine you have um, a set of wires. So we have five wires, and the colors um, map to variable values of these wires. If you want to check, imagine your, your snark circuit demands that um, the first, the fourth, and the fifth wires have the same value and uh, that the uh, second and the third wires, they can be, they're not linked to anything, they can be whatever value you want, want them to take. Um, then what you can do is you can say, well, th then you can define a, a permutation mapping. So if you map wire one to wire five, wire four to wire one, wire five to wire four, and you then kind of you reorder your wire values um, according to this new permuted index, if they are the same, then it means that um, the wire values have been copied correctly that y values 1, 4, and 5 actually are identical to one another. Um, and that's how we do our copy checks. So the, pro the problem would be, right? It's Pardon? It's the problem would be, right? Because it's like, it's a permutation. Probability, did you say? Yeah, yes. Probability. So it's probabilistic proof. So it's like with overwhelming probability, but yeah, there is like a, there's a security parameter in there. It's like 1 in 100, and 1 in 1 to the 128. Depends on the security of your curve. Um, um, and... Yeah, and so the, uh, the, the key innovation that Ariel um, and I came up like to describe in the Planck is basically how to do this efficiently um, with the minimum number of commitments um, and with the minimum number of prover overheads. Um, uh, yep, Sorry. that's it for Planck. Okay, so Marlin is working with R1CS constraints, and these are reasonably standardized. You'll find that uh, most ZK interfaces are using R1CS at the moment. I'm not going to go through how it works at all today, but if you want to see some slides that I've written for a different presentation, then just give me an email and I'll send them over to you. The general idea, though, is that we have this matrix equation, a Hadamard product, which says that um, the Hadamard product of a matrix A times this vector with B times the vector minus C times the vector is equal to the zero vector. The matrices are public, and these are what define your program. The vectors are private, and these are what define your program input. So what Marlin is doing is we are trying to convert an R1CS system into what we call a linear check and a quadratic check. Our linear check is what I'm explaining in the handout. And this is really the hard bit, the bit where we had to come up with technical innovation. And what we need to do is we need to send another vector, a committed vector, and prove that that committed vector is equal to the public matrix multiplied by that private vector for all three of our values. The easier bit is then checking that this Hadamard product actually holds. Ah. Here's a question, have you got the cards? Uh, somewhere, hold on. <laughs> Um, I'll let Mary explain this, but um, it, this is uh, our attempt to provide a bit of intuition behind the trusted setup process and why you can have an extremely high confidence that um, like a well-executed trusted setup is completely trustworthy. Um. <laughs> okay, so I have five cards 
we have the Ten of Diamonds, a Joker, the Ten of Spades, the Ten of Clubs, lots of tens, sorry, badly shuffled, and the Queen of Hearts. What we're going to do is we're going to shuffle these cards, and this is meant to be representing our trusted setup. And at the end, we're going to ask the question, who has the Joker? Okay, and this is essentially going to be representing our secret, which if you knew, you could break our scheme. So if the setup is done correctly, then the probability that you guess correctly should be one in five. If something goes wrong with the setup, then the probability that you guess correctly is going to be about one. Um, but in real examples, assuming the setup has gone correctly, the probability that you guess correctly should be about uh, 1 over 2 to the 256, which is a very, very small number. So? So we're going to have six participants. Each of them is going to take the cards, shuffle them, then pass them along. You are not allowed to look at the cards and this is something which, in the actual schemes, is cryptographically insured. We're going to assume the worst case scenario, where you only have one honest participant. So, me and Zach will be party one and party two. Okay, so nobody is looking at the cards but the honest party is not going to describe to other people how they shuffled the cards, they're not colluding. Yeah. Dishonest people, can, they, they, they can't see the cards, but they can tell everybody, like, I shuffled them in this order. Security on this cryptographic, because it's a strong assumption that you can't cheat like that. It's, discre it's discrete log. Yeah, it's, it's yeah it's that's, that's a standard cryptographic assumption. I do like what we want to reduce this to, so basically, if if you can trust that at least one person was honest, then um, the scheme is secure under the discrete log assumption. Okay, so please could we have four volunteers? Fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful, just two more winning victims. <laughs> Fantastic, okay, okay so like right. Have Who's the least trustworthy of, of all of you? Uh, no, no, the most, oh, no. Oh, the the most, most trustworthy. trustworthy. Who's Sorry, the most yes. trustworthy? I could be the one. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, could our paragon of virtue please exit the room? Uh, <laughs> because we're about to provide some information which, uh, oh, as an honest participant, I you don't want to see. <laughs> okay, shall I take Actually, I think if you just like look away, oh, okay. it's probably yes, enough for the yes. demo. But, <laughs> <laughs> but again, please don't cheat. And we're going to look at the cards to start. But after we've looked at the cards, no more looking at the cards. No cheating, please. Okay, so this is the order, everyone. We have the Ten of Diamonds, followed by the Joker, followed by the Ten of Spades, followed by the Ten of Clubs, followed by the Queen of Hearts. Opposite way around. <laughs> right. Okay, so party four is looking away, I hope. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, this is how we are going to shuffle the cards. <laughs> And as you'll notice, we're not shuffling them at all. We know exactly how we're permuting them. Mm. So I'll go first. first card. Mm. So first one needs to be swapped with the second one. Okay. The fifth one needs to be swapped with the fourth one. How else if you have a count of cards in a casino? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, no okay. Ten. Dishonest party number two. Uh, I'm, I'm also, show them. also dyspraxic party <laughs> number two, so I hope I can do my bad shuffle correctly. Um, okay, so you're swapping, you're swapping card one with card three. Yes. Okay, I've done that. Fantastic. Okay. Right, I'll hand three. it to my colluding party. <laughs> yep. Be rich. One with fifth one. Okay. Could our honest? Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Could our honest <laughs> party please enter the room and pretend they heard nothing? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Honestly. No. Seems to be shuffled. Yep. And the Monta Party Four. So I and guess. Please look away and yep. lock your ears again. 
What's this, I guess what, what I was trying to demonstrate is it's, it's a very binary outcome, right? Just because we're all colluding and we're, we're telling each other how we're shuffling, it, that doesn't give you any more, that doesn't give you any useful information as long as one person is honest. It's not like you get a kind of like degrading security the more people collude. Um, it's really much an all or nothing process. Well, it looks like one of our colluding parties might have accidentally forgotten its uh, secret shard. <laughs> Security through obfuscation, it works, people. Uh, <laughs> there is five missing. Hmm? Yeah. Oh, so there is. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, mm. we'll improvise. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to hand these out now, hand them out to five people. Oh, it can be us five, actually, that works. Awesome. So, so does anybody think that they... Final, a final slide of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> does anyone think that they know who has the joker? Apart from the person who has the joker, they probably know. Yeah, well, that, yes, this is like the world's worst magic act because we don't <laughs> reveal your card at the end. <laughs> so the idea well, is... Well, the idea is that nobody knows. You never do. Because um, the honest person less detected in the middle. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, so here, like, the joke represents the toxic waste. And so what we want with our trusted setup is we want, like, um, an encrypted representation of that toxic waste. So you, you, can, you, can, you have it as an elliptic curve point, so, for example, if you have an elliptic curve point G and the circle point is X, you have X multiplied by G, you have X squared multiplied by G, et cetera, and you can use these um, uh, to commit to, comp to create kind of polynomials um, because you can multiply, you can take, you know, some hydrogen polynomial, take each coefficient, multiply it by the relevant elliptic curve point that maps to, like, um, the relevant power of X. And you can do that without actually knowing, having any idea what X is, which is really, really important because if you do, then um, both Plonk, Marlin, Sonic, Groth, everything um, uh, relies on that assumption. Yeah. Cool. Ah. <laughs> Duncan has a joke. Cool. Thank you for listening, everyone. And a round of applause for our volunteers.